Uh, I'll get everyone to quickly introduce themselves. Just say your name, say where you work, and say what one technology or possibility uh, around all the things we've seen over the last few days that you're really excited by, but really quickly. So, Andreas, go. You already know me. Um, I work for Opera Software. I'm Andreas Bovens. Um, and I'm really excited about some of the stuff I just showed you, ambient badging and pop back into browser. Great. I'm Jack Archibald. Uh, hello? Yeah? I'll just shout. Uh, I'm Jack Archibald. I'm a developer advocate on the, the Chrome team. Uh, and I'm really excited about streams, as you heard yesterday. Hi, everyone. I'm Emily Schechter. I'm a product manager on Chrome security at Google. Um, and as most of you probably imagined from my talk yesterday, I love HTTPS <laughs> and TLS and secure connections and all that good stuff. Great. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm John Gisong, uh, working, working on Samsung Internet team. And I'm editing service workers. <laughs> uh, I'm Alex Komorowski. I'm a product manager on the Chrome team. And I'm excited uh, that the web uh, still has that strength of uh, no gatekeepers. That's really cool. Hi, Dan Applequist, uh, also working at Samsung and W3C Tag co chair. Um, so, two hats on this panel. And I'm, um, uh, I think I'm really interested in uh, the, uh, the experimentation going on, some, some of the stuff that Andreas presented around how, how, what the lifecycle management of progressive web apps are, how they get installed, how we might be exposed to the URL, all that kind of stuff. Hi. I'm Alex Russell. I'm a software engineer on the Chrome team. And I'm most excited about how much faster you're going to make the web this year with all the stuff that we've just built. I'm Tal. I'm a product manager on the Chrome team. And I'm most excited about PageSpeed module and how you can use it to help users save data. Hi, I'm Ben Kelly from Mozilla on the DOM team. And currently, I'm probably personally most excited about streams, because that's what I'm trying to implement at the moment. <laughs> and I think it's cool. Hi, everyone. I'm Ali Alabas from uh, the Microsoft Edge team. And I'm really excited about service workers. I'm Tao Tran. I lead uh, partnerships for Chrome and the web platform team. And I'm most excited to have everyone's phones be a <laughs> combination of native and web apps. And it doesn't matter to the user. Nice. OK. Um, some, so uh, my name is Jeremy. Uh, I work at a little agency called ClearLeft. I'm a web developer. Um, and something we sometimes do when we're kicking off client projects is we'll have what's called a pre-mortem where we say, OK, it's nine months out, the project's finished, and it was a complete disaster. What went wrong? And I'd actually like to do that in terms of the web and where we are. Yes, it's a very exciting time, but maybe it's good to get out into the open what the stakes are. And what are the worst case scenarios if we fail with these progressive web apps here? And I'm particularly interested in hearing from uh, not just Google, but also from Microsoft and from, from uh, Opera and from Mozilla. So uh, Ali, actually, I mean, how important is all this stuff? I think it's very important. Actually, um, if you guys aren't aware, uh, Microsoft has this concept of a hosted web app, which is something that we had uh, started back in 2011 um, as part of our web apps journey. And uh, just recently, we have this thing called a hosted web app, which is basically just a manifest that you can publish to the store, which points to a URL. A URL um, and then you can basically run your app uh, in, inside of Windows, whether that's the phone or an actual desktop, and it, it runs it in its own contained state. So uh, we do have some kind of uh, history there with, uh, with apps and the web together, uh, and we're really excited with these new technologies such as service workers and, and the cache and fetch and whatnot to really bring forward some of the technology that uh, will help us get to apps that are more like their native counterparts. OK, Ali, that wasn't what I asked. Uh, ben, uh, for Mozilla, how, how, what's at stake here? How does the web look in five years' time if this stuff doesn't succeed? <laughs> uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, I don't have a crystal ball. But I mean, I think all the data is suggesting, right, more and more people are using mobile to start. And uh, I, I think, as Alex has pointed out, a lot, a lot of people are spending the majority of their time in native apps. So creating a more compelling uh, capability on the web for people to build useful uh, sites that people want to spend time in is really important because there has to be a real value there for people to use the web on the mobile. And if we don't build that value for people and allow it to be, to and allow people to get locked into the silos again, I think we lose a lot of the value of the open web in terms of being able to share information freely, being able to 
uh, not just consume the information, be able to share it freely, and have an open marketplace where new ideas can come in, uh, not just in content, but also from browsers and, and whatnot. Um, well, in the case of you know, Microsoft and Google um, and, and Apple, you know, they got backups because you know, not betting on the web. Andreas, Opera is pretty much all in on the web, right? It's, it's all you do. So uh, what does the end game look like here if, uh, if, the, if these technologies don't take off? Um, yeah, it is a bit, it's a bit scary, of course, uh, especially because we've uh, invested so, so strongly in the web. So it's because we believe in, in, in it, and it's, you know, it's open nature, it's power, and so on. So it is, um, it has, well, I've been concerned or increasingly concerned about you know, sites or services that just use a website to channel people to uh, download the app. Um, and so it's, it's really exciting to, uh, to see less of that and more an experience fully in the browser than uh, you know, handing off everything, all the exciting stuff to native apps. So uh, yeah, it wouldn't look so pretty, I think, mm. if, if uh, mobile was completely dominated by, by uh, native app uh, native app frameworks and, 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 and formats. So, and, and, yeah. and Daniel and Young Key, in your case, I mean, Samsung, you, you own the device. Why do you need to, to, to bet on the web? Because, you, you know, native works for you guys. Actually, actually uh, well, web ecosystem is really important to Samsung as well, because we have uh, all the devices deployed out there, and we made our own browser. And also, uh, it's a new ecosystem to us, uh, added to those Android and Tizen ecosystems. So we see our op opportunities uh, there together with you. So it's well, the reason why I'm here to just say that it's, n it's not only Google, but we are here together as a team web. Yep, team web, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Alex, everything's going to be fine, isn't it? I mean, five years out, if this stuff doesn't take off? I'd like to sort of uh, flip the question. I know you're going to. I was going to flip the question later. So what, uh, we start but, with the dystopia, then we go to the utopia. Oh, okay. Well, then I'll wait. But, so, okay, what are the stakes? Uh, my belief is that large stable platforms don't actually die. They just sort of pass quietly into the night. And so the web could do that. That could be a thing that happens. And more and more of the experiences that you want to spend your time in just aren't available there, especially as you switch form factors. Form factor switches tend to exacerbate those existing tensions. Um, and so if we want to continue to have a free and open, interoperable, cross-device, cross-platform ecosystem that any new OS could show up and play in, or any new browser could show up and show a better way. I mean, what Andrea showed is incredible, right? The, the UI innovation that comes from not having a single gatekeeper, like Alex said, is, is what made, has made the web so powerful. And if the platform can't support the experiences people want to build, that that momentum will slow. OK. Um, so I want to address something, because a lot of questions are coming in uh, from that document you're filling in. And there were a lot of questions about Apple. You know, When will mobile Safari do this? When will Apple do that? There's no point in me asking those questions to any of the people up here, because they don't work for Apple. Um, I guess it is a big elephant in the room. They were invited, uh, but they're not here. And they generally don't tend to come to uh, any events like this. But some people might think, well, you know, even if mobile Safari doesn't support uh, service workers, that's OK, because I can install Chrome on iOS, and I can install Firefox on iOS, and I can install Opera on iOS. Would anybody from those companies like to explain exactly what those browsers on iOS are? Just clarify. Uh, I can. Ben, Andreas? Uh, uh, sure. Uh, I believe the store, the, the, uh, the iOS store has a, con, you know, a uh, contractual constraint that they don't allow um, you know, the execution of JavaScript or downloaded content that hasn't gone through the review, executed code that hasn't gone through the review. So you can't put up a generic browser that downloads JavaScript from the web and run it. And um, you know, their explanation for this is to prevent malware. You know, they don't want people to. Uh, there are other side effects, I guess you could say. Uh, so that means that Chrome, I believe, uh, Opera and Firefox are all essentially wrappers around Safari's engine inside. And there's different ways of doing that, uh, which I'm not an expert on. But, uh, and we try to add value at the product layer and, and at the network interface layer. You can do some, some things by intercepting the network requ uh, requests. But it's not uh, the same Gecko engine or uh, Blink engine running there. 
So okay, so there you have it. So but you cannot install any other browser, basically other than Safari, onto iOS, right? Uh, web, web UI view, I believe. But there is a mode where you can switch to press server side, press to rendering. But then, you know, the engine lives on the server, not really on the, on the client. Right. And even if you can, uh, it won't support service workers either because that's sort of a different, you know, it needs to live on the client. So it's yeah. kind of a yes, but, but actually not really type of, okay. type of thing. <laughs> so, so, but, but then, um, so let's say on Android, where I genuinely do have a real opera. Uh, yes. mobile installed and a real uh, Firefox or Android installed. And uh, uh, if it's a Samsung device, then I've got Samsung browser installed as well as Chrome. All right, so maybe I'm trying different browsers. Let's say I, I visit a website that is a progressive web app in Opera, and I add it to my home screen. Uh, or maybe I visit something in Firefox and add it to my home screen. Now, each time I open one of those things I've saved to my home screen, am I opening the browser again? Or if my preferred browser is, let's say, Chrome, do they open in Chrome? How does this work? It's, it's the first one. It's the, that you'll be opening it up in the browser that you used to add it to the home screen. And that's the same that if you've got like Chrome and Chrome Dev and Chrome Beta installed, uh, and you add to the home screen using one of those, it will launch in, in the one you added to the home screen using. OK. Is that because with progressive web apps, the storage is done with the cache, and each browser has its own individual cache? It, it's actually it could be quite confusing if you tap on a thing and you forgot that you know it's a that you added it with a different browser and then you clear out the cache and now you find the thing that you added to your home screen and maybe you even forgot was built using web technology no longer works. So that moment when you add to home screen we are increasingly seeing as sort of a special moment when you mint these things into something that feels more like an app. Okay, so it's the storage is basically at the browser level because it's individual caches. Is that the best idea? I mean, we see push notifications happen at the OS level. Should storage be at the OS level? But let me ask you a question. How many people besides like us web technologists in this room like have like five or six different browsers on their phone that they use all the time, right? I mean, most people have one browser that they use on their phone and that it's because it's the browser that shipped with the phone, or it's the browser that they're that the people that you know that that they know who know something about this told them to use, or they saw an advertisement for Chrome and they saw they saw something. So then, that they're going to stick with that. So actually, I, I've been thinking about this issue too because you can have multiple progressive web apps from the same web app installed onto your phone simultaneously. Actually, that's not. It's actually a good thing for testing. I'm not so sure if it's a real user experience problem because, again, I don't think most people use multiple browsers. OK. Uh, while I'm diving deep in how I would interact with progressive web apps on different browsers, uh, let's say I go to example.com. It's a progressive web app, uh, and I install it to my home screen. Now, later, I'm surfing the web in a web browser, and I follow a link to example.com. Now, I take it that's just going to open in the browser. But could it perhaps pop open like an app? Uh, it's Almost like web intents, right? Where instead of at the protocol level, now it's at the URL level. Yeah. Alex, you look like you're thinking about this. Sure. Yeah. So uh, we have a technical limitation today because of the way Android works. Other OSs could do a significantly better job here, by the way. We've designed the technology between manifests and service workers to give you this idea of the scope for the service worker, which joins up a bunch of different URLs. So we could say, if you navigate to example.com slash thinger, that that is actually a navigation that should be handled by the example.com app. Um, and we can send it there, and we could open it in new UI. Today, we have a system limitation on Android that prevents that. We can't know when a progressive web app has been uninstalled from your home screen. And that means that we can't reliably decide to send you to a full screen thing. Because the home screen icon is basically the permission to run something full screen. That prompt that you're saying yes to, it's adding a capability to the website, which is the ability to run full screen. And so if you've revoked that capability, but we don't know it, it would be bad for us to just open it full screen again. But I think there's a, a future in which that's exactly what happens, potentially, where if you navigate to URLs that are handled by an app, just exactly the same way they work in Android, you should be able to do that. You mentioned permissions there. And it seems like a lot of what progressive web apps are doing is seeing what works on native and, and doing that. So oh, nice having your icon on the home screen, launching full screen, all this kind of stuff. Well, so I, uh, I would say it looks more like native is looking at what the web does with permissions and copying us. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, we, should we be looking to native apps in the way they handle permissions? Well, no. I mean, and, and so we've always gone with the model of, of ask just in time that, you, yeah. that we need the permission. 
and, and we're sticking with that. We're, we're looking at sort of uh, other ways to innovate there. But it's very much things like Android are, are switching to a model of the just, uh, just in time thing. So, you know. Yeah. We're ahead on this. Oh, actually, while well, I've got you here, speaking of native, looking at the web, what the web is doing and kind of imitating that, what's the deal with the streaming apps, native apps thing on Android? Oh, in, instant apps. Yeah, instant apps. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, like so slap across the face to the web right there. So I don't see it as quite a slap across the face, I guess. And I think Google often tries to make sure that developers on different platforms can have be successful. And I think historically, when you look at uh, web, you've had low friction, which is due to this incredibly powerful security model that we've honed over the past 25 years collectively, which is uh, quite an accomplishment. Um, you have this low friction, but also low capabilities. And native apps have historically had uh, high capabilities, but also high friction. And so Progressive Web Apps has been a multi-year effort um, from multiple browser vendors, bringing, working on service workers, push notifications, to bring those high capabilities to the web. And I think that the Android native uh, instant apps is kind of similar in that it's a multi-year effort to bring lower friction to, uh, to native apps as well. But what I think is cool about progressive web apps is we've worked on this together. You've seen a bunch of different browser vendors who are, uh, either have already shipped a bunch of these capabilities that you can use today with more on the way. And so that's what I think is really cool is you can go out as a developer and use this stuff today with progressive web apps. So Alex, is, how do you feel about streaming web apps or, or streaming native apps? You, you want it to succeed? You behind it? So I think it's great that like lower friction allows users to be exposed to a diversity of experiences, and I Not think that's what I fundamentally asked. good. Not what I asked. So, so I think it's, I think it's good for that native apps are also learning uh, from some of the things that uh, web has done well. Just like I think it's great that the web has learned about some things that uh, like robust offline uh, push notifications and other things that we learned kind of from native. I think that's great. I think it's interesting because last, last time we were on a panel together, it was in, uh, in Brighton, and it was kind of at the time where some people were sort of saying, should, should the web stop adding features for, for some amount of time? Should it stop developing? Uh, and the case I made then is like, no, we, we should look at the things that are successful on native, and we should take those. Because do you know what? They're coming for us. They're going to do the same. And, and this is part of that. They're coming for our best features, so you know, we, should, we should go for theirs as yeah, well. This is the kind of dystopian five-year outlook I was looking for, Jake. Great. <laughs> <laughs> But I wonder if like, the, the question isn't like what we think about and whether we want it to be successful. I think at the end of the day, it's about developer success, right? And so like making sure that developers have access, you know, if you, if, if you believe that your business is going to do much better on native, then I think we want you to be successful there. And if you think your business is going to do better on the web, we want you to be successful there as well, right? So I think for us, it's really about making sure that people, like developers like yourselves, have like the best tools across both platforms. Yeah. It's funny. The first day we had great talks from you and Alex talking about, you know, comparing numbers between, between native and, and web. And there were some great numbers in there, like the average number of apps installed per month or added you know, to a home screen and mm -hmm. native apps is zero. Well, if that's the case, why are we chasing after the home screen? Uh, how will we know we've succeeded if, if people install an average of zero web apps to their home screen? Because then we've achieved parity with native. Well, so, so for me, one thing that's important with this is with native apps today, there's this all or nothing choice. I haven't met this thing before. I don't know what it's going to do for me. And I have to decide. Do I want to add this to my home screen? Which well, not, not anymore with streaming uh, native apps, right? Well, that's, I think that's the, that's the direction they're trying to get to, to, to some extent yeah. as well. Um, but that's why I think with progressive web apps, it builds on that, uh, that progressiveness. That's one of the reasons progressive is in the name, is that as a user, you go to it. As you use it, as you build a relationship with it, you can progressively build a better experience with push notifications, home screen, and all the rest. And that you. You've spent time with this thing, so you feel more comfortable giving it more permission to do extra things for you. It's not, it's not a cold call. Can, right? Yeah. It, it's not a cold call. You're not like saying, hey, would you like my app? It's more like, you like this. Do you want to keep it? And, 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 if, you, and if you don't <laughs> want to, if, you, if, you do, if it's something that you're only going to, if it's an airline that you're only going to ever use once, right, and, or you don't think you're going to fly them again, uh, you're probably not going to put them on your home screen. You're just going to use it from the browser. And that should be fine. And the whole, the whole application should work fine within the browser, within a regular tab. Then you find out next year, oh, actually, I'm going to be traveling a lot to Riga. I better um, uh, you know, put this on my home screen. OK, at that point, you can make that decision, right? It's like it, it's up to the user. And I think that that's an important aspect. Yeah. Yeah. The, the data the usage is a, is a huge thing that we hear over and over and over again, even from users in you know, wealthy Western uh, countries. Yeah, the, the storage constraints that devices have, ignoring even the data cost or the fact that you need connectivity to install it in the first place, just yeah. create a huge difference in the accessibility of even trying something out for the first time. And so I think 
we do need to both go in each direction, but each has something that it's geared towards. So if you're building an experience that is really targeting users who are just coming online, a native app might not be the right choice, and a web app is probably the right choice to remove some of those barriers, but there are other situations where it might be the reverse. And the user shouldn't have to pay the price. Uh, us as developers should pick what's best, given the problem tell, we're trying tell, to solve. We talk about the, the next billion. What kind of devices? Are they, are they newer things, older devices? What are they tend so to So they're, they're new devices in that they're being built new, uh, yeah. and they're released in certain years. But a lot of their specs are ones that uh, we associate from sort of previous years in some of the more uh, developed markets. So in the US or uh, in the UK or Europe, we'll, there'll be devices that we think of from several years ago. Uh, they may be shipping Jelly Bean on the device. Um, device size might be a lot smaller. Amount of storage space and RAM uh, will be a lot smaller. People rely a lot more on SD cards, which means they can also remove it and hand it to someone else. Uh, and so how people are actually interacting with data and storage constraints just varies pretty drastically. As yeah, well. so I guess, I mean, the responsibility is on us to be responsible with, with storage. Um, and I think something, Alex, in your, your talk yesterday, you were showing the uh, AMP demo there with the Washington Post, and uh, you, you, you click through, and there's the Washington Post AMP thing, and uh, it was able to install the service worker with that custom element. But I was looking at the URL bar, and that wasn't the Washington Post. It was on the CDN from... So I talked to Paul back to explain it's an iframe, and using an iframe, you can install a service worker from somewhere else. Uh, Emily, that, that seems to violate the principle of least surprise to me, right? I thought the whole idea with service workers was it can only, you know, same origin. And I realize iframes kind of are just a browser window, but I mean, we could abuse this pretty badly, right? And fill up a device with 20 service workers when you've only visited one web page with 20 iframes. So service workers require HTTPS, and I explained some of the reasoning uh, behind this yesterday. Um, it's absolutely like uh, one of the reasons um, is because service workers sit between the browser and the network, right? And so that means that any person on the network um, could be managing the requests that are sent back and forth. Um, and that's actually why we require HTTPS. But, uh, but for is the iframe thing a bit of a loophole there about the same origin and that I feel like I'm visiting one URL, and yet it's installing service worker or service workers for another URL. So, so one of the things about this is actually, uh, if you embed an iframe today in another page, and it might store stuff in IndexedDB, you can do the same, you can have the same kind of uh, behavior. And so actually, one thing to clarify is that service worker is using the same storage that the website would have been using, using other technologies, IndexedDB, the cache, others. Mm -hmm. And the browser reserves the right to evict those under certain conditions. And so it's similar, actually, in practice to what's been uh, possible to date. That specific demo, uh, the AMP install service worker element on, on the CDN hosted version of that document, um, that element is a little canny. It looks to see if the canonical URL uh, in that document is the target URL that you're trying to install for. So it won't let you install them willy-nilly. It has to be the same document there. So that's built in the AMP install service worker. But I could, I, mean, I could put on my website a bunch of iframes that load other websites that yes, have to have built. Absolutely. And this is actually part of the web's most powerful, second most powerful feature. The first one is URLs, of course. But we do runtime composition like no other platform ever has or <coughs> ever can in a safe and trustworthy way. Like, we are only because of the safety that Alex mentioned earlier, because we've actually honed the security model where we are relatively good compared to other platforms um, about user privacy and security. That's the only reason we can do anything across origins or with mashups. Um, so, I mean, yes, but that's the status quo, and it's also an incredible power that we've got and nobody else can get. So that, that um, storage demo that we saw earlier, storage abuser thing, that, that is using iframes. It's not using service worker. It's just yeah. iframes and index DB and, and yeah. everything. So it's, it, it's not a new problem. That's so iframes. I, I just wanted to point out also that there's room for browsers to add some features here. Like you can go and turn off cookies in third party iframes. It's very similar to that. And currently in Firefox, if you turn off third party cookies and iframes, we don't allow service workers in those iframes either, mm -hmm. or index DB or any other storage. Nice. And so I may be wrong, but I think Safari has that turned on by default. It'll be interesting if and when they implement, if they make a similar decision. And but speaking of the things that browsers can do differently, we've, we, we're all familiar with the Chrome um, algorithm, I guess, for adding to home screen, right? It's got to have HTTPS, got to have a service worker, you've got to interact with it a couple of times. Uh, Andreas, uh, what, is it pretty much the same for Opera or tweaking it? Uh, um, the install banner, you mean? Yeah. Um, for now, it's the same. It's yes. the same? We've implemented okay. the same logic simply for 
consistency, but we could tweak it. It's, it's like uh, there, there's other, you know, could be other conditions, but it mm. seemed pretty reasonable. Um, and and currently Firefox doesn't do you have any automatic? We're, we're still looking into it. Like the, the experiment that was run was very, you know, if you visit it five times in a period of time, we would show it. But I, I think we, we need to have a designer look at what's okay. right there. I, I am a little bit cautious just because this is a heuristic that's not spec. Almost, I think it's on purpose to allow some yeah. innovation yeah. here. And at the same time, we do see some convergence on a single heuristic so far. And the feedback I've gotten from developers is they care a lot about it. So they're trying to meet that heuristic. And so it concerns me a little bit. OK. That not so spec. Ali, is Microsoft going to have an automatic <laughs> banner pop up? Or? Yeah, uh, we're looking at a few options. Uh, we're still in our planning phase for this specifically. But uh, we want to be as uh, uh, we want to not be as restrictive um, as we can. So for example, if you have a responsive um, application, you have a web manifest, uh, we think that's enough for you to uh, declare that you're an application. <coughs> uh, we've also talked a little bit about, um, in, in that post that Jacob Rossi had about the progress of web apps, um, how we're looking at maybe leveraging Bing to crawl the web uh, to find any manifests that we want to ingest um, as apps into the store. So that experience would actually um, allow you to install with the store onto your machine. And, and the other thing the browsers can do differently is, like, uh, Andreas, what you showed us there with the ambient badging, yep. it's like, great, shots fired, Opera's uh, taking the lead here. Uh, beat that, uh, other browser vendors. Any, any plans? Any ideas? Want to share this with the rest of the class? Well, first of all, I wanted to answer your previous question about the heuristic, because actually yeah. Samsung browser have this, have us have have more like what um, Ali was talking oh. about. It's just uh, a purely uh, needing the manifest file. So you're so saying the, HTTPS is not a requirement? Uh, HTTPS is a requirement. Oh, okay. So okay. Just HTTPS. Want to clarify that. Yeah. yeah. No. It's actually, uh, it's not a requirement because uh, it uh. doesn't really require service workers yet. But uh, there's a history. Like we uh, shipped W3C manifest in our 3.0. And we shipped uh, service workers in 4.0. So uh, by that time, uh, we shipped uh, W3C manifest. We just wanted to uh, deploy it. And we uh, found it that uh, some, of, some of the uh, content providers in Korea actually use it as a uh, like hosted web app. And that's why we uh, actually started from there. So we are still experimenting uh, that uh, what would be the actual actually uh, better user experience, also uh, distributing this progressive web apps uh, in a better way. So we are still just working on okay. it. Uh, Emily, I take it that, that, that the progressive web app at home screen is a nice carrot for you to dangle in front of people and say, <laughs> this is a reason for moving to HTTPS? Um, sure, you could say that. I think there's a lot of different uh, reasons why we want people to move to HTTPS. Do you, do you tend to prefer carrots or sticks? Do you, do you, do you, you know, <laughs> like to threaten people that they should move to HTTPS or entice them to move to HTTPS? I think um, both could be useful in, in certain situations. Um, but I think we like to think of HTTPS as actually one of the things that enables the web to be so open and so low friction. Um, and so it's actually a very positive thing. OK. So on the ambient badging, uh, if anybody's got any other ideas, just shout them out. You know. I just, just want to say, I think it's awesome to see what Opera's doing here. And I think it's going to be really interesting to see what other browsers do. Because it's not 100% clear what this should look like. And that's one of the awesome things about having multiple independent implementations that are looking, trying out different UIs, and seeing what works best in yeah. practice. So we've, uh, I think another thing I want to emphasize is that uh, we've heard a lot of developer feedback from a lot of folks. And that's uh, led to us changing some of our heuristics right now. And one thing that we've seen again and again is there are some use cases where the very first visit, you know as a user, I want to add this to my home screen. And you want some way, some affordance to do that or know that it's a special thing. And so we're also exploring um, some ways to do some ambient badging uh, the, for progressive web apps as well. Something else that comes up, you know, the idea of discovery or re-engageability with progressive web apps is the idea that, oh, we need a progressive web app store. Or now we see Microsoft are actually going to treat them like regular apps, right? Yeah, they'll, they'll be first class citizens uh, in terms of other apps. They'll be right up there with other uh, native applications in the store. So when you search for the app, you'll find it like any other application. But do we need a progressive web app store? I mean, it, it'll be the same thing. It, but but it, isn't, isn't Bing.com a progressive web app store? Kind of. So, 
I think about this in terms of distribution. You make an experience, and you want to get it in front of users, and what's the way that you can do that most effectively? As a developer, you're trying to get users into your experience, and as a platform, we're trying to make sure that only experiences that are worth keeping are things that you're actually sort of in your face to ask to be kept. So that's where the heuristics come from. But discovery can happen in lots of different ways. Search is a great one. I'm so excited that Microsoft is doing the store route. We've talked a lot about that on the Chrome team. Um, I think the ambient badging that Opera is leading on is, is outstanding. And I think we're going to see all of the above, really, because we're here to try to help you get your experiences in front of users when they like them the most. But I do think that I would like to see us tightening, I guess in my personal opinion, tightening the heuristics from what we have now in Chrome. Because um, and, and, we detect a service worker now, but I want us to, to get to a point where we're detecting an offline experience. I mean, at the very least, a fallback page. I, I really want us to be able to build user trust in the things that end up on the home page. Yeah. And I think if we end up showing browser error messages, that's, there's, there's no trust there. Okay. And, and, and so, Andres, in your, in your prompt, prompt at home screen, you also don't accept display browser uh, for, for adding that prompt. Is that for me? Or is yeah. It? yeah. Um, uh, I think we do, actually. Oh, so uh, there is a in difference. The, in the, yeah, we do accept uh, display browser as well, as far as I know, at least. I'll ah. have to check, but yes, yes, we do, because in The Guardian it works. So Opera takes the lead again. So, All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but I think it's, I think this, you know, having these strict um, heuris or like strict rules for when it's shown, uh, both in terms of technical capabilities and, uh, and, and user uh, user engagement, they're pretty crucial. At first, you would think, well, let's try to make this as easy as possible for developers and just show it as soon as possible and so on. But then aside of this maybe not, not being ideal for the user, it sort of also, I think, makes everybody a bit lazy, like, well, it will work and I don't have to do much. Just include one file and it's like this magic file you put in the, in the root and suddenly everything, you know, it's, you, you get all these banners for free uh, and, 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 you know, add possibilities to, 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 add, to get users to add things to the home screen. I think it's good to start with pretty strict requirements and maybe even make them more strong mm -hmm. over time just to sort of make the web better and make it really worth it. Like, because adding something to the home screen is like a special thing, right? It's, it's like a privilege. A, you know, it's a privilege, right? Uh, it, it's like, a, you know, um, a certain KPI, if you will, like a kind of a conversion event or whatever you, whatever you call it. Um, and, and I think that's, that's important to keep in mind. Yeah, apart from Samsung, all of you that make browsers, so you also make browsers for the desktop as well as mobile. How does add to home screen look, work, feel? on desktop. I mean, I use Slack, and it's a desktop app, but I know under the hood it's actually web technology. So any ideas on how we're going to cross that uncanny valley? So you've, you've heard my answer. Um, uh, you guys have seen probably the WhatsApp uh, for desktop, which is basically just a web view instead of an application that you could put on your desktop. So as far as you're concerned, it's, it's an app. Um, and that's sort of the same idea with uh, Windows. But the install process there is you go to the, the store? Uh, so for, for that, the, the, the WhatsApp example is you go to the site and you install it from there. But for what I've described uh, earlier, you'd actually go to the, the Windows store and you'd, you'd search for the application and then you can install it. OK. Well, well I'm, I'm, I'm in a browser. I'm at a URL. It's a progressive web app. I'm on a desktop browser. I, I want this installed. So we've, we've actually launched an add to, add to shelf. But uh, Butterbar inside of Chrome for Chrome OS. So that exists today. So if you load a progressive web app there, you should get it with the same heuristics. Um, we're still looking hard at what that would mean or what the UI would mean. Desktop is, you know, we supported a bunch of desktop OSs. And there are a lot of differences in getting high quality system integration. Um, actually, it's a little bit easier when you just have one activity at a time in Android than it is to sort of like handle all tab and all the rest of the details yeah. of the desktop OS. I'm, again, extremely excited that Microsoft is going to lead on this. Yeah, Chris. Um, just to check, because um, I'm running out of time, do people in the audience have questions? Eager? We have, we have a couple. OK, well, let's get Paul to throw the microphone. Uh, where's, the, where's Paul gone? Yeah, he's got the microphone somewhere. He can, you can throw it over there. Uh, meanwhile, I just want to be setting up while, while you're getting the microphone. Uh, yes, we're, we're hearing from Matt a lot of a lot of uh, disdain for uh, documents and a lot of excitement for apps. And we've been talking about progressive web apps. <laughs> I wondered if uh, anybody here could tell me what an app is. Anyone. As opposed to you know, the rest of the web. I, I, look, right. Progressive web app is a, is a marketing term. No, but right? just app. Like, just app. 
What's an app? Can I try it? Yeah, go. I'm, 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 I'm going to be the fool who tries. <laughs> Don't do it. Don't. It's a trick. It's a trick. <laughs> <laughs> It's not an app on Android because it's made with Java. It's not an app on Android because it's made with C++. It's not an app on Android because you distribute it one way or the other, sideload an APK. It's an app because the overall user experience is set by the OS about what is a first-class citizen and what isn't. And so being an app is simply meeting the user's expectations of all of the other things that the OS has given privilege to and all the other affordances that you're integrated into. And that's what an app is. Is that what you're seeing, Tao, when you, you know, looking at <laughs> native, looking at web? Do, do people generally think, like, it doesn't matter. It's, it's just an app. I don't know. At this point, I mean, I, I will come from a, uh, a non-technical perspective on this. I mean, when I think about an app, it's just people just think a better user experience on mobile. I mean, and that's... You know, so we often describe progressive web apps as like these app-like experiences. So, so people better. think about it. Just, just it's just it's a better. more like like native access to probably the OS, access to the device, being able to actually feel like a rich, fuller experience. So I, I think about it in terms of what the user is able to experience, and less so about kind of the distinctions in terms of technical specs and stuff. So is it a, is it an app when it's still in the browser? I haven't added it to my home screen yet. Uh, is, is this an app? Anything. Yeah. Anything that is an application that you interact with to achieve some goal is, uh, is an app. Is my I mean, blog an app? Yeah, yeah, Google Maps on my browser is, a, is on, my, on my computer. Yes, well, yeah, I think so, you know, okay. yeah. You know what listening to me? It's a trap. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a trap. Uh, it's but amazing, yes, we, can, we can divide the whole web into apps and documents, isn't that something? Yes. Hi. Up to your Hi. mouth, please. Don't lick it, but close to the mouth. When you are browsing in the, in the App Store, you see how big an app is, and when you try and install it, and you have, don't have enough space, well, it says, sorry, you can install it, and then you have to choose what you remove. But when a progressive web app, you install it, and you don't have enough room, the browser decides what to remove, and then the user loses, might lose an app that he likes to keep. How do you think about that? So, so this is part of the, the, the storage APIs that we saw earlier, this, this idea of being able to request persistent storage. Uh, and if you're granted that permission, then you can store as much as you want, and the browser will not remove it. Uh, and, and the hope is we can get to, to a position where if the device does come under uh, storage pressure, then you'll go to the menu you go to where everything's listed with the biggest thing at the top. But it won't just be Chrome sitting there using you know, gigabytes. It will be origins, like all of your persistent origins will be there separately, so you can decide, ah, do you know what, that game can go, but all of my offline videos can stay. You can cache the, uh, the, the request with the service worker. Can you upgrade that to a persistent storage? So, just want to... Just clarify, uh, we've pulled the world's largest bait and switch at application installation time, right? By the time you get that, that prompt at the bottom in Chrome today, we've already done all the work of storing everything, right? You've already got all, that's the, that's the best part, right? You, you're already using the thing. The question isn't do you want to install it, it's do you want to keep the thing you're, you've already got, right? We're doing the upsell. We're not like trying to get you into the car in the first place. It's like, do you want leather seats? There was somebody else had a question right behind you. I think, okay, just throw, throw the microphone back there. It won't hurt. And, and I think it might have to be the last question because uh, run over. Yeah. Um, hello. Um, I have a question. It's too loud. No. no? Uh, <laughs> I have a question related to the future of native apps. So some years back, everybody wanted to have an app because uh, it was the app boom. So everybody invested money, developers invested time learning new stuff. And now we see with progressive apps that we are moving towards a different paradigm. So in the future, if these things really like is a thing, what will be the future of uh, native apps? Why would I want to install a native app if I get the same from this? This is brilliant because this pretty much ties into how I was going to wrap this up, which was <laughs> instead of the, the pre-mortem, we'd have the uh, five years out, we've succeeded, progressive web apps, uh, people are using them, but this is a great addendum to that. What, what are people using native apps for in this beautiful utopia of progressive web apps? Uh, who wants to talk about this future? 
I, I, like, I'd, I'd say that how high uh, games that require high CPU and high GPU will be the, the last, the last things to sort of come the to the web. The last bastion. Okay, games. Uh, what, yeah. Well, in my in 2006, I posted a vision of kind of a future of web, I'm a future of mobile, basically, and um, because I saw that a lot of people were starting to this pre-iPhone, a lot of people were starting to download internet-connected apps for photo sharing and all this kind of stuff. And, and my view, which I still hold, is that native apps are going to play an, a, a role in that. But more and more, the web, uh, and alongside of the web, sorry, the web and native apps are, uh, or should, play, should both play a role. And we want the web to, where, uh, wherever possible, to become the vector for whatever experience the user uh, gets, uh, for whatever uh, applications the user is using. So w whether that's a, a native app or a web app. So I think that's the future that I see, because I think that we, we're never going to do away with native apps, and nor should we really seek to do that. Mm -hmm. But I think that the, it, if we make the web as good a platform as it can be, then we're going to make everybody's lives easier, including users and, and developers. And Ali, you have yeah, a vision? I, I, I think we shouldn't think, that, think of this as a competition. I think it's more about providing options for developers. So whether you're a web developer or you're a C++ developer, you have options. OK, Tal, paint me a picture. Five years out for the next billion, how does life look? Well, I think there's always going to be a next billion, at least given our population growth around the world at this point. Okay. So there will probably be a new next billion. Uh, hopefully, the, the billion we're currently thinking about uh, will be online. And ideally, if we do everything we've talked about here, able to access really great experiences, even under the conditions they're in. Uh, but I do think we'll see probably devices that we think are top of the line today that might not be considered top of the line in three, five years. And while we're seeing a, really a lot of improvement in network connectivity um, around the world, and I know there's a lot of ambitious goals in making that the case globally, uh, there will still be people who are coming online for the first time and don't necessarily have the context of, that we all have uh, with the internet and have their different context. Who knows what form factor it will realistically be? You know, maybe it's going to be like, I don't know, some crazy thing you wear on your toe. Uh, who knows? Um, but there'll be people who have never interacted with anything. So as soon as we're sort of looking at these transitions, there's always going to be a next billion. I don't think it'll be solved. And we're going to be needing to adapt. And just I think the biggest takeaway is just think about people who come from a context different than your own and figure out what that context means for how you can make sure that the problem you're trying to solve can be solved for them as well. Brilliant. OK, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, I want to thank all the panelists. I want to thank uh, Paul Kindle, actually, for asking me to moderate this, because I thought that was pretty brave of him. Uh, uh, but ladies and gentlemen, we're having a lunch break next. But uh, please give it up for all these panelists. Thank you.